Yeah. All right. Yeah. So welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining uh, this seminar. So today is my uh, great pleasure to host uh, Dr. Khaib uh, Mirakni uh, from Google, uh, New York City. So uh, Khaib is a distinguished scientist uh, serving as a senior director for the New York and the Jewish Elvison research teams at Google Research. Uh, he received his PhD from MIT in 2005 and his bachelor's degree from uh, Sharif University of Technology in 2001. Uh, then he joined Google Research in uh, 2008 uh, after spending a couple of years at uh, Microsoft Research, MIT and uh, Amazon. Uh, he is the co-winner of uh, multiple uh, best paper awards, including uh, the best paper awards in KDD uh, 2015 ACM EC conference 2008 and uh, SODA uh, 2005. Uh, his research areas including uh, algorithms, distributed and stochastic optimization, and uh, computational economics. The specific areas uh, of uh, research include uh, market algorithms, uh, graph mining, and uh, large scale optimization. So I believe today uh, he's going to talk about. Uh, uh, some of his uh, uh, focus on uh, research areas. So please join me in uh, welcoming uh, Dr. Uh, Nilakni uh, to give the talk. Thanks a lot, uh, Kwan. Kwan uh, like, yeah, thanks for having me. Um, I'm going to give a talk about recent trends in online advertising research. Uh, and the focus is going to be on robustness, automation, and learning aspects. This is like uh, based on several papers that uh, we have written in the past couple of years and with my colleagues uh, at Google, Columbia University, MIT, and other universities. Mm. And the focus of the talk is going to be uh, important academic research problems and not necessarily uh, like Google ads products. Uh, I'm going to uh, discuss optimization problems related to ads products. Uh, but the uh, focus is academic research. Uh, so before I dive into the topic of the talk, uh, I have like one slide about where, where I'm coming from. Uh, I come from like the algorithm and optimization team. Uh, this is the team that um, like works on like these three major areas, market algorithms, graph mining, and large scale optimization. Uh, we perform from fundamental research in these areas and we have like several uh, like internal projects. We have like external pages, uh, the slides, for example, if you uh, click here, you'll get, you'll see like some, uh, some of the papers that we have written and, and so on. So I'm going to focus on the market algorithm area mainly today uh, and the advertising part. But uh, we also had a recent workshop about the graph-based learning and graph learning, graph mining project. And there is uh, also more uh, in the area of optimization for machine learning and so on. So the talk is about online advertising markets. Um, it's, um, it spans over like different type of ads products. Uh, advertising market is still like a growing market. Um, each area, Google Ad Manager, Search Ads, Shopping Ads, um, different types of advertising products. Uh, they have uh, their own research challenges, but there are like some common research themes that go across all of these uh, products. And uh, we have common advertisers who actually spend across different channels. And that results in like having common research problems. So the focus of the talk is going to be problems that span uh, different ads products. But just to give you examples of two uh, important um, advertising ecosystems, there is the display advertising ecosystem where we have um, publishers uh, like New York Times, uh, or like content providers. Um, they are going to show ads to sponsor their content. And these are advertisers and uh, ads agencies that interact with these uh, publishers through ad servers or advertising exchanges or advertising networks. So they interact either through a real-time auction or through offline negotiations and then having ad servers serving their ads, satisfying some constraints uh, in the contract. 
just to give you a sense of uh, what happens when uh, like an ad is uh, served, a display ad is served. Um, like a user goes to a website and the website um, publisher send a request to an ad server. The ad server, when it receives the request, it sends the request to, the, to an advertising exchange. Advertising exchange uh, send requests to ad networks and ad networks based on the properties of the, um, the website and like the information that the exchange provides bid uh, on uh, like showing their ad uh, on this page. The advertising exchange run an auction and um, return an ad for the, um, uh, from the spot market. Now the ad server has the choice of choosing an ad from the reservation contracts or choosing the ad that uh, uh, the advertising exchange returns. And like based on that choice, it uh, uh, like serves a selected ad. Supposedly, uh, maybe like the ad server has like um, creatives and stuff related to each of the ads and uh, they can serve um, that and this whole process should happen uh, in the matter of tens of milliseconds. So whatever optimization we do, for example, in the server should happen very fast and like should be uh, done like in a distributed manner because these ad servers also are across the board. Another example of uh, advertising ecosystem is the sponsor search advertising ecosystem in which the main players are users who go and like search for something and advertisers and the search platform itself. The main method of uh, charging and the main charging scheme is based on uh, clicks or conversions and uh, the ad platform, the search platform computes click through rates and conversion through rates. And the main type of auction that runs in these type of scenarios is what we call generalized second price auction or the GSP auction in which we sort the bids based on bid times PCTR, bid times uh, conversion rates, and uh, pick the top K bidders. And the payment of the uh, bidder uh, I is going to be the minimum uh, bid that they have to pay uh, to keep their position, which is going to be bid of I plus one times uh, PCVR of I plus one uh, over the PCVR of uh, I. Um, like be there on. So the search um, uh, advertising ecosystem and in general, the ad ecosystem is moving toward automated bidding strategies. Uh, so I wanted to just give you a sense of what, what are these automated bidding strategies. There are like what we call uh, target CPA and target ROAS uh, bidding strategies that the advertising networks or like the proxy bidding frameworks um, bid on behalf of advertisers. So in the case of target CPA, the goal is to get more conversions with your, uh, the target, uh, with the, like a target cost per, per action. So the advertiser is willing to pay uh, something per, uh, like on average, you know, like an amount of money per, um, per um, um, like action, but on average. The target RAS is where the advertiser specified target return on, uh, on ad spend. So uh, the advertiser may have different values uh, for uh, different uh, type of conversions. So why do we uh, have automated bidders and where, why is the market moving toward more uh, auction automation? Um, the main reason is that advertisers have different type of um, business or uh, goal uh, in mind, but they have to participate in the auction with like a simple bid. Uh, like, and the, the bid is going to be compared with other properties of the ad. Um, so what the auto bidders do is to submit, uh, what the advertisers do is to submit high level objectives and constraints. Like they want to maximize the number of clicks or the number of conversions and they have some constraints. For example, they have a budget constraint or they have an average targeting constraint. And the bidding system bid on behalf of uh, these advertisers. So the auto bidding system basically bridge the gap between the advertiser's high level goals and the per, per query bids. 
So this results in many uh, interesting research questions um, uh, from both bidder's perspectives and the auctioneer's perspective or the seller's perspective. There are like many uh, problems that show up. We also have problems that the intermediaries between the publishers, for example, and advertisers have to solve. And um, this uh, like results in like different optimization questions and learning questions in the bidding strategy and auction uh, parameter uh, setting. An important aspect of the automation is also to make sure that the whole advertising system uh, works in a robust manner. Uh, it's robustness against a strategic behavior of advertisers and other players in the market, robustness against noise or mistakes or even adversarial corruptions. So the talk is going to cover uh, research uh, in these areas. Um, it has four parts. I most probably will be able to cover three and maybe just uh, give you like a very brief summary of the fourth part. The first part is about auction automation. It's the most recent part and it's the, there are like new optimization problems there. The, the other three parts are focusing on like basically the robustness. First, we talk about robustness against noise in online optimization and maybe online learning. Um, then uh, we talk about robustness against gaming or incentive, what we call incentive aware learning and incentive compatibility metrics. Uh, and finally, we combine the, the last two parts um, and talk about robustness in dynamic um, auctions or repeated auctions or what we call dynamic mechanism design. So the first part is about auction in auto or like uh, auto bidding world. It's based on um, two published papers or three published papers and uh, two uh, working papers. In order to discuss auction for automation, we have to distinguish between two types of advertisers. I should uh, emphasize that the first part is more auction design um, and is very much advertising oriented. And this, uh, the next parts are more like high level optimization and online optimization. So for this part, we have to distinguish two types of advertisers or two types of buyers in the systems. In the system, the utility maximizers are um, advertisers who are trying to optimize or maximize their quasi-linear utility, the value they get from the system minus the payment. The value maximizers, on the other hand, try to maximize their total value subject to what we call a return on investment or ROI constraint. They have a target ROI or an average uh, value per um, um, like, um, per uh, dollar that uh, they, are, they are willing to pay. As long as their average value is um, like at least tau, a parameter that's given, they want to maximize the total va value of the conversions that they get. So that's what we call value maximizers. So the questions that arise in the auto bidding world is, um, if standard auctions like first price, second price, or generalized second price auction are still effective in this like new way. So the standard uh, economic um, like modeling says buyers are utility maximizers, but now we are facing a different type of um, advertisers. So we want to answer these two type of questions. Do existing mechanisms continue to perform well or characterize optimal mechanisms or revenue optimizing mechanisms in this uh, new world? Uh, what we'll observe uh, is, first of all, we know that uh, truthful auctions or second price auction achieves a one half of the optimum in the auto bidding world, uh, like against value maximizers. But we have a new uh, set of um, results and like um, auctions that we call quality based boosted auction that improve the outcome of the auction from like a one half approximation to uh, C plus one over C plus two with some for some parameter C. Um, and then uh, we also characterize the optimal auction in auto bidding board in a new piece of, in a new paper that's now on uh, available uh, online. Uh, so I have, I have a question about uh, yeah. the, the C, uh, divided by C plus one approximation in previous slide. Uh, so I want, yeah, so uh, yeah, this is C plus one divided by C plus two. 
so if a C is a uh, uh, so so if a C actually is a very small, right? Then actually, this is uh, very similar to like a one half uh, approximation. So, do you know what's the the, the range of C uh, in your guarantee? Yeah. So, like there is a theorem that we can prove, uh, which gives us like a hint that maybe these quality based boosted auctions are actually useful. So. C cannot be too large, but it, it, it may not be too small either. Like maybe it's one or two. So it can improve the theoretical uh, approximation factor. But we also do some empirical study on some real data and I'll, I'll report uh, results on that as well. I see. So, yeah. And where does the, the upper bound of C uh, come from? Is it from some computational like uh, limits or is it from? Yeah, so I, I'll have a slide about this. But okay. the short answer is, as we increase C, actually we may hurt revenue, but we uh, improve welfare. Okay, so, okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll have two slides on that. Paper. Okay, thanks. This was like the general overview and I'll actually elaborate on these papers now. Okay, I mean, okay. not elaborate, I'll give one, two slides on each. Mm -hmm. uh, so first, uh, let's go over like some insights about what is an optimal auction or why do we need auction design in the auto bidding world? So when we have target-based bidders, that have to satisfy this target ROI constraint, we can rewrite the objective function of a value maximizing buyer uh, by just mm, like um, taking uh, like ba ba uh, taking like this tau um, and uh, like rewrite both the constraint and objective. And now we see that what appears in the objective apart from the payment is very similar uh, to what appears in the um, in the um, constraint that we call actually the target adjusted value. So when we adjust the value by the target, um, we note that if the target ROI constraint is satisfied actually, maximizing revenue of the auction and maximizing the welfare of the auction Welfare is uh, basically the revenue plus the value that uh, advertisers or the buyers get from the system become equivalent. So as long as we can satisfy the constraints, uh, one idea is to basically simply rank um, the target value, target adjusted value numbers. So we ask advertisers for their bid and uh, the target, uh, the value of the target, and then we can just sort based on this. But the problem is that uh, advertisers do have in incentive to game and uh, give us like different uh, values and targets to uh, get better outcome. So we need auction design. And as I said, like if you run a simple second price auction um, without the taking into account the target, target adjusted value uh, in equilibrium after um, the buyer's response, the welfare of the outcome is one half of the optimum welfare. So in this uh, recent paper, we have what we call the quality-based um, quality based boosted auction, where the ranking uh, of the advertisers is what we call the quality-based ranking. So we first uh, come up with a quality signal or quality score that is correlated with the target adjusted value. For example, here we say uh, is target adjusted, uh, is the target ad adjusted value itself is between quality over alpha and quality times alpha. Um, the allocation is going to use this quality score by taking the bid of the advertiser, but then adding C times quality. And this is the C that will appear in the approximation factor. Uh, so this is what we call the uniform boosts. So, so Basically, we take the bid based ranking system uh, and maybe a second price auction based on that, but then we move it toward what we call desired ranking, which is the target adjusted value based ranking. But we don't know the target adjusted value itself. Let's say we find the quality signal. So if we can do that, and then we have a truthful incentive compatible, uh, basically payment scheme, then uh, the, the theorem is that we have a uh, um, uh, like an equilibrium that has better uh, worst case approximation guarantee. 
So for the case of C equal to zero, we get back to the one half approximation. So this is like the first uh, observation in the paper. We also, we can also generalize this result and like handle what we call uh, target constraint and budget constraints. And uh, there the type of auction is a bit more involved. So the boost is going to be, um, has like this property that the boost of the i-th uh, candidate minus the boost of the, um, like the j-th candidate is going to be at least, uh, the difference between the boost is going to be increasing uh, and is going to be c times the quality um, score. And for this type of uh, setting, we can also show that even with bu budget constraints, uh, we can compete with the liquid welfare of the benchmark ranking. So this is a bit technical. So uh, I just want to emphasize that this was like in theory and in practice or like on, on data, we look at uh, some semi-synthetic data that is inspired by the real data, but is, is also like not exactly the real data. Um, and like we show that basically uniform boost or this what we call benchmark boost increase. So the theorem only talk about uh, increasing welfare. So we see that, yeah, like we do increase welfare uh, by some percentage, but if we choose C uh, not too large, we can also, we see that uh, we also increase revenue. And uh, that's, that should be useful in these type of scenarios. Um, in a, in like the second paper I mentioned, we look at uh, what we call characterizing the optimal auction. So in a Bayesian uh, setting where we, the advertiser, uh, like the seller may know some Bayesian information or some prior uh, information on the values or like private values of the uh, buyers, uh, we can talk about basically what is the optimal revenue optimizing auction, which is for example, in the case of utility maximizers, is a simple Meyerson auction. Meyerson designed like the optimal auction uh, in general, uh, and like this was a Nobel Prize winning um, result. So, in the case of auto bidders, they have two private values. There is the value itself, and there is the target. Uh, we notice that in some cases, the value of uh, advertisers. Um, are actually can be captured by uh, the probability or of the co conversion or the probability of the click. So these predicted click to rate and predicted um, conversion rates are harder to game in general. So we can look at uh, like three scenarios or like four scenarios that these private values are not really private. If they're both public and are known, then we are facing an optimization problem and not a game theoretic or auction design problem. In the full generality, we have both private value and private target, but we can assume that maybe the values are known because it's hard to game, or we can assume that the targets are known. So there is a question of what is the optimal auction in, the, in different scenarios. So in this uh, second paper that's uh, available online, we, what we do is we look at different scenarios, these different, these three scenarios. And in the case of public value um, or public targets case, uh, we show that the first best revenue is achievable. So what we call the, the, the best uh, welfare and revenue at the same time is possible to achieve. And uh, we also uh, characterize the optimal auction. This is for the case of value maximizers where bidders are trying to maximize the total value subject to the target constraint. So the first price auction on target adjusted value is actually the, the solution in this uh, model. And there is a payment scale second price auction uh, scenario that achieves the first burst. But in the case that both prime uh, values and targets are private, we show that static auctions cannot achieve the uh, first best revenue. So it's not possible to achieve the sum of the to like total values as the revenue here. And characterizing the optimal auction remains open. Interestingly, like the display ad auction moved to first price auction like um, two years ago. The reason that the display ad market and advertising exchange for the display ad market moved to the first price 
is not this at all. It's, it was like other reasons that there is a competition between exchanges and, and so on. But this is an interesting um, like observation that this is actually maybe a good auction for the case of uh, automated bidders, which is like getting, uh, like uh, which is increasing in the display ad market as well. Uh, for the case of utility maximizers, which is the more traditional like economic uh, uh, utility uh, modeling for buyers, uh, we show uh, that in these two scenarios, we can characterize the optimal auction uh, uh, like at least for one buyer, but we also observe that the first best is not achievable. Uh, so that's like, yeah, like the first attempts to un understand the optimal auction in, in this um, new world of auto bidding auctions, but there is more to be done in this space if you're working in like mechanism design and so on. We also like, uh, so like here we have been uh, trying to understand the optimal auction from the seller's point of view, what seller's point of view, what is the optimal uh, way of like ranking or pricing? Uh, if you look at the problem from the bidder side as well, there is a game theoretic question uh, going on that the auctioneer is trying to optimize something and the bidders are also trying to optimize their value subject to the target constraint. So in a world that actually both of these sellers and like the buyer is trying to learn their bidding and pricing strategy, we have a stylized model and like in the recent paper uh, that uh, under, tries to understand what is first of all the best bidding strategy when we have both ROI constraint and budget constraints. And uh, what we show there is that still a threshold based bidding is going to uh, be optimal, what we call uniform bidding. But now knowing the structure of the optimal uh, bidding strategy for buyers, we look at uh, the problem of uh, learning the price from the seller side and show that uh, the structure of the revenue function as a function of the price, the, the seller set has this um, basically bell shape. And uh, with this, because there are like a small number of parameters that the, the, the seller has to learn, we design like a learning scheme that will converge to a good uh, low regret outcome for both buyers and the sender. So that's like a, like a new piece of work that uh, also needs to be extended uh, in several directions because we make some, for example, assumptions on um, the structure of the seller's pricing strategy. It's like a simple posted price auction. So to conclude the first part, uh, we first uh, noted that the existing auctions may not be suitable for the target uh, based auto bidding world and like maybe quality of our, of our um, allocations may benefit us here. Uh, we also modify existing au auctions to um, improve efficiency and characterize optimal auctions. There are many open problems in this area. So the dynamics of the interactions between the bidders and auctioneers are still like open in this new uh, auto bidding world. And um, there is a question of what is uh, the best, uh, like, is it possible to use a non-truthful auction along with the non-uniform bidding strategy and get uh, like a better outcome in equilibrium? There is also a question of characterizing optimal auction with private value and private targets. So I'm done with the first part, uh, which is like the longest part, uh, section uh, of my talk. But if there is a question, I can take that before moving to the robustness. Okay, so let's go over the more optimization part and robustness in optimization. So the second part is about robustness in online optimization and online learning. And it's uh, based on a couple of papers, uh, like two of them are like um, older papers, but we have uh, recently uh, done more in this space. Um, so that's why I'm talking about this topic. So the topic is online ad allocation. Um, so I mentioned that uh, advertisers have budgets and um, in the budgeted allocation or what people used to call AdWords problem, we have advertisers with some budgets, 
They're online nodes. These are users or basically impressions or page views. When a page view arrives, we have to decide which ad we show. And we assign these online nodes to uh, basically these advertisers on the other side. So we face like an online bipartite uh, assignment or bipartite matching problem. So what the, what, uh, the greedy algorithm uh, does in this space is at each time it would allocate it to the um, advertiser that has maximum revenue or ma max, maximum value. So if we do this, uh, we will uh, allocate like this, but after some point, maybe the budgets of the advertiser are, are exhausted and maybe this uh, new uh, page view, we cannot get more revenue out of it because we already exhausted the budget of this advertiser C. So it can be suboptimal. The greedy algorithm here we, will give, give us like a revenue of eight, but the optimal allocation is to go after this greedy matching, which has a value 11. So we say here that the greedy algorithm achieves the approximation factor of eight over 11. And this uh, approximation factor depends on the instance and the arrival order of the online node. So we are, we are facing an online optimization problem. Uh, so that was online budgeted allocation. We can also talk about online weighted matching problem where instead of budgets, we have capacities. And the capacities are degree constraints on a bipartite graph. And like a similar um, basic greedy algorithm can be applied here. Uh, greedy algorithm has like cardinality three weight um, eight. Uh, yeah, so I think, uh, I'm like, yeah, there is also like the optimum allocation here. So in all of these, we can talk about different arrival models and different approximation factors. So we say an algorithm is an alpha approximation and alpha competitive. In the worst case or adversarial scenario, the condition is if for all type of uh, like orders of the um, arrival of the online nodes, the revenue of the algorithm over the revenue of the optimum is at least alpha. In the stochastic model, on the other hand, we say uh, we have alpha approximation if in expectation, the revenue of the algorithm over the revenue of opt is at least alpha. So these approximation factors should hold over like different type of instances um, over all instances, uh, on the worst case or competitive ratio case, we know greedy is a one half approximation. It's at least 50% of the optimum in the worst case. And there is an algorithm that achieves one minus one over E or 63% of the optimum. The algorithm is a primal dual based type algorithm. In the stochastic case, on the other hand, we can solve like dual linear programs. We can uh, get actually asymptotically optimal solutions or one minus epsilon competitive solution. So you see that in this case, there is a possibility to achieve one minus epsilon on average, but in the worst case, we cannot achieve better than uh, constant. Uh, there is a question of which of these models is right. In the first paper, several years ago, we talked about what we, we have, what we call simultaneous adversarial and stochastic um, approximation. We say that the adversarial model is too pessimistic. The real world data may not have all these adversarial input. The stochastic case is maybe too optimistic. It, it, it's not uh, handling um, the traffic spikes, for example, properly. So the goal is to design robust algorithms that achieve the best of both worlds. And uh, you've seen more, more of this in the bandits literature recently. So uh, what we showed for the online allocation problem in the simultaneous adversarial and stochastic approximation was if we, say an algorithm is an alpha and beta or A and B approximation. If at the same time, the same algorithm is alpha competitive for adversarial model and beta uh, like or B approximation for the stochastic model, then in the unweighted uh, matching case, it is possible to achieve the best of both worlds. If we know that the budgets are large or the capacity are large, large, there is a simple algorithm that achieves one minus one over E in the adversarial model and one minus epsilon in the stochastic model. But in the weighted case, on the other hand, we cannot achieve the best of worst world. In fact, we show that if an algorithm achieves one minus epsilon in the uh, stochastic model, it cannot achieve better than 
four times epsilon uh, square root of epsilon in the adversarial model. So if um, this is one minus one over e, which is the best possible, we cannot get better than 97%, for example. And on the positive side, we can get um, and one, a one minus one over e comma 0.76 approximation. So there is a gap here to close for theoretical problems uh, for optimization. But now this first model was what we call simultaneous approximation. Can we do better than that? One idea is to use forecasts in some way. Like we have some forecasting uh, on like the type of um, page views or type of users that arrive. A hybrid algorithm may learn some dual number variables from the forecast and then it may blend it, for example, with adversarial duals. Uh, so in practice, we actually noti uh, noticed that like greedy algorithm achieves on several data sets um, like better than 50%, which is the worst case, but maybe 70% of the optimal. The optimal algorithm, which is one minus one over approximation, the worst case achieves better approximation, 82%. If we have a good forecast and we are talking about the stochastic model, uh, on the same data sets, we achieve 87%. And if we combine them in a hybrid model, we achieve better approximation, 89%. So the, the second model is actually trying to use this stochastic forecast, but we want to be also um, um, robust against adversarial deviations. So we use uh, the forecast uh, to come up with the strategy, but um, we also check for uh, adversarial corruptions and like change the algorithm. Uh, yeah, in, in terms of approximation factor, what we get is uh, not like a single number as an approximation, but uh, an approximation that's a function of the accuracy of the forecast. So. The way that we model the accuracy of the forecast in this case is we define a parameter lambda that is the optimum that the, for, uh, the, the, the forecast, if, if the input comes according to the forecast, we get like an optimum. But if the um, input, uh, the real input that has the adversarial items uh, has another optimum. So the, the ratio between these two is like what we call lambda. If lambda is one, we have very good forecast. If lambda is zero, then we have maybe like very off forecast. So uh, what we want to make sure is that if the forecast is really good, we get asymptotically optimal, but then uh, the approximation factor should decrease gracefully as lambda goes to zero. Uh, if we apply the stochastic optimization algorithm, the, actually the approximation factor will go to zero uh, for the adversarial input. The interesting thing here is that for the weighted problem, we can get this function, uh, the, the red curve, uh, this is the function um, that we can achieve in this um, EC 2015 paper. Uh, for the unweighted case, we can achieve the green curve and we can also show that achieving better than the blue curve is not possible information theoretically. So, yeah, so that's the second model. But in the second model, we still need to have forecast and use the forecast to basically guide the algorithm. So can I have a question about uh, yes. the, the comparison between uh, unweighted and the weighted algorithm? Mm -hmm. So my understanding is uh, uh, unweighted algorithm just means we assign, for example, the, the uniform uh, weight to each uh, no, item. No. Sorry, no, no. Uh, the weighted and unweighted here means weighted matching and unweighted matching. For the case oh, of unweighted matching problem, it's mm -hmm. a simpler problem. Remember in the simultaneous approximation, we can actually achieve the best of both worlds. Uh, but right. in this case that we have a forecast, we can achieve this function, which is the green curve. So it's a simpler problem, so we can do better. So that's right. It. Yeah, but, but the thing is unweighted is a special case of uh, weighted. So well, yeah. shouldn't there be a, like a phase of transition? I mean, uh, depending on how skilled the, the, the weight are. So shouldn't there be a, like a phase transition uh, between this so weighted? I think the weight doesn't use the weight at all. Like actually it's the beauty of the algorithm that maybe it's not sensitive to the weights. If, if, I, if we had an algorithm that 
uh, was like very sensitive to the different the distribution of the weights than what you you said should, uh, would uphold. Perhaps. Okay. Okay. I see. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, so the, the third model, which is the most recent thing, and I'm very excited about, is uh, the model is neither adversarial nor stochastic, and we don't have like a specific forecast. And so we want to have an algorithm uh, that doesn't use any forecast. It's like a um, design, like basically without using any um, forecast information. But we want to make sure that. Um, under adversarial corruptions, it achieves um, like a good performance. Under different type of arrival models, if, if it's like completely stochastic, uh, on average, it should achieve, achieve asymptotically optimal or very low regret. If uh, we have ergodic input or like different type of seasonal or periodic uh, changes uh, or like shocks uh, in the input, it should achieve good, prop, uh, like, uh, good approximation. So what we do in this recent line of work um, that is, um, uh, yeah, like, uh, like in submission to operation research uh, journal, um, also like uh, to a conference and like a, uh, like a earlier version of the paper which appeared in ICML, we design what we call a mirror descent framework, uh, like dual based algorithmic framework that so the algorithms are greedy, but not uh, like on the original base on a, like a bait adjusted reward. Uh, it's like a mirror descent algorithm. It's very fast and fl very flexible. It actually also handles like nonlinear functions. So like you can add regularizers like for fairness and like diversity and things like that. And uh, the most interesting thing is that it achieves good theoretical properties for a variety of models or what we call the best of many worlds. Um, in the stochastic input, it achieves one minus epsilon approximation. For the adversarial input, it achieves uh, fixed uh, competitive ratio. And for other models, the stochastic models that are popular, it also achieves good approximation. So I should oh. say that in this paper, we also make some mild assumptions on the distribution of base and so on and so on. Of course, it's, these are realistic assumptions, but still like there are assumptions. So we can achieve much stronger result for like a very general set of algorithms. Hi, uh, mm -hmm. I have a question. So sure. uh, I just noticed that you mentioned that this algorithm can deal with a non-convex action set. So uh, I'm just wondering, so how, how, how does it happen? So because it's a dual, it's a, okay. Uh, I have actually, I cannot go back somehow in my slide. Uh, uh, so, because the algorithm is based on uh, like a dual uh, mirror descent technique, when we add, so we, we have to change the algorithm when we change the non, uh, like the objective to non-convex and, and so on. But the algorithm is actually flexible and we can use duality in the, like for convex optimization to achieve um, basically still some guaranteed approximation for those type of objectives. Um, I have to elaborate on that and it takes some, uh, yeah, like we don't have time. So there is actually a paper on archive by the same set of authors that uh, has the, it's called online allocation with fairness constraint, for example. Um, so you can take a look at that. Okay, thanks. So, uh, yeah, so to summarize this, this, this part, uh, we talked about different Hi. type of robot. robot. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I also has another question regarding the uh, adversarial perturbations in this setting. So mm -hmm. I wonder, like, uh, what kind of, like, the adversary could do what kind of uh, a corruption to the, in terms of, I mean, in terms of uh, the order of the nodes coming or in terms of the uh, values or the, the budgets, um, like, what, what kind of uh, perturbation can they actually perform in this setting? When we talk about adversarial corruptions, we allow for any, uh, um, corruption, but uh, we may, uh, so like in the second part, for example, we mm -hmm. limit how much uh, adversarial corruption by that parameter that I mentioned, for example, uh, okay. in each of these scenarios. So we don't restrict the time, when we talk about adversarial corruptions, it can be uh, like 
when it, they, in, it can be on the item which is not following any distribution assumption, for example. Uh, okay. so like we have a stochastic uh, input with, without no, uh, like with unknown distribution, but part of the input is completely arbitrary. Um, so in fact, like uh, we have similar results for online learning and online bandit that you may have seen uh, if you're following the bandit literature. Uh, in the like stock paper, we have actually like we combine stochastic and adversarial bad bit by saying we have an algorithm that achieves like uh, the the best regrets under stochastic um, input, but as like the adversary injects like um, for C uh, like items, uh, it can like provide arbitrarily corrupted input. Uh, we want the regret to be uh, to to be still bounded, and it's going to be a function of the number of adversarial corruptions that we, we inject, for example. Okay. So yeah, thank you. Um, so yeah, like um, that's basically a new line of work that uh, is also related to what we call the um, algorithm design under ML advice because the ML advice could be the stochastic input and, and so on. I think like I'm done with the second part and I'm a bit behind. If there is no further question, I'll uh, go over the third part. Yes. Yes, please. Okay. So the third part is about what we call incentive aware learning. So it's robustness again, gaming. It's about learning parameters in auctions or in environments where uh, the agents have incentive to uh, change uh, basically their input because they can benefit later. So it's like a, maybe like a uh, repeated interact uh, interactions with a um, with an agent who has incentives. So, for example, in the context of second price auction with reserve. So when we run an auction, or second price auction with a reserve price, um, just to give you a sense of uh, where the incentives come from. The second price auction with reserve auction, if it sets lower reserves, it produces higher utility for buyers. The buyers provide their bids. And the second price auction may look at the historical information or like basically the empirical distribution of the bids of the buyer and produces a price for them. So because it, uh, it may be like an, uh, a repeated interaction, buyers have, incentive to lower their bid such that the empirical distribution that the auctioneer observed for this buyer is lower and they compute a lower reserve price so they can pay less over time. So like this can, even though like second price auction with the reserve is a truthful auction, it doesn't have incentive, but when we put it in a, uh, like a repeated scenario like this, it creates uh, incentives for buyers. So this is like a longer story, but in the static setting, um, we can model this as like engines with uh, basically some private types and an algorithm that uh, maps these private types to a system outcome. So when we face large enough markets, uh, we observe that there is an approximately optimal incentive compatible mechanism that uh, basically uh, achieves uh, both like approximate optimal welfare and approximate optimal incentive compatibility. So the idea is actually related to uh, mechanism design to via the differential privacy. And the high level idea is if um, we have basically the different uh, options uh, to choose from with different values x1 to xd, instead of choosing the reserve price, for example, or the option that maximizes my revenue, I'm going to choose the auction, uh, like the outcome with probability exponentially proportional to the revenue of the outcome. So I don't compute the argmax, I compute um, probabilistically based on uh, the weight scheme like this. So this will give us a differentially private implementation that at the same time, um, uh, achieves like uh, provably good uh, incentive compatibility property if we have large markets. So this is 
that can known technique that we applied for the large market set scenario. But in a more recent paper, New York's paper, we actually noticed that getting good um, incentive compatibility does not have to go through the softmax function and uh, or basically differential privacy. So differential privacy is an overkill for this problem. Uh, we observed that in our application, a weaker uh, property, um, uh, which is like called, uh, which we call like Lipschitz condition in a total variation distance functions to, uh, is sufficient. And as a result, we can get better bounds in uh, the trade-offs between incentive compatibility um, and um, basically uh, the welfare of the auction. So this is like a long uh, paper and I'm not going to um, go through the details, but it has yeah, like uh, interesting uh, follow-up work because what we have here is a very theoretical algorithm and it's like would be interesting to design like a more practical algorithm for this scenario. We also look at the repeated auction scenario that I covered at the beginning uh, of this section in the, what we call the contextual auction. So we say if the context uh, of buyers uh, come from like basically a distribution that has, uh, has this form that there is a context and there's a private value for uh, the um, basically uh, user. But then there is a common uh, noise or common value uh, that we have GIs. So the value of buyer I come from a distribution uh, like a form like this and the betas are going to be the private values and the unknown. So in a model, in a scenario like this, the question is how to come up with reserves in a repeated auction environment. And we, what we achieve is what we call a sub, uh, we achieve a scheme that has sublinear regret against the best second price auction with reserve in hindsight, like knowing um, basically um, the, uh, like the whole uh, scenario, what's the best reserve I could have put. So here what we use, uh, the ideas are to use episodic learning and to address incentive values. And instead of using the bits to, to come up with basically the, so for each episode, in order to come up with the price for that episode, what uh, we use is not the historical bits, but like a censored like version of the data. So for example, we only use the fact if, if a bidder win uh, or reserve or, or not in the previous uh, episode with some bits. So with this, we minimize the uh, amount of data dependency and with that we can get um, like some incentive compatibility properties. So we talked about incentive compatibility here and I have five minutes. Uh, there is a question of how to measure incentive compatibility. We also address this important question in a recent paper we call uh, to, to find out what is the incentive compatibility of an auction uh, in a data driven manner. So there are other ways to um, quantify incentive compatibility in an auction, but they are very hard to compute. Uh, and uh, they require like um, complicated sampling and optimization. What we do is inspired by the Meyerson formula, we define a, a, like um, an intuitive notion that uh, basically says how much the, uh, the buyer benefits by deviating their bid, like by perturbing their, their bid by a factor of one plus alpha, and we compute the limit of this as alpha goes to zero. So the interesting thing about this uh, exact definition is that for the first price auction, <clears throat> for the first price auction, which is not uh, incentive compatible at all, the measure is equal to zero. For the second price auction, it's equal to one. And if we have an auction that we probability lambda we run a first price auction and probability one minus lambda run a second price auction, the incentive compatibility metric is actually going to be equal to one minus uh, lambda probably. So this uh, new incentive compatibility metric has some good properties. It can be computed actually easily on data by looking at the log uh, information uh, like the bits. Uh, 
we all, um, so there are like several other properties that we show in the paper. And uh, finally, we look at uh, different types of uh, auctions. For example, the, um, um, basically second price auction with dynamic reserves that are computed in a less incentive compatible way and the GSP auction, which is not incentive compatible, but, uh, but it's not far from incentive compatible either. And we, we compute the IC metric on some real data sets and report the sensitivity of the IC metric to like these methods that are not incentive compatible. Um, so one interesting question now is, uh, how can we basically uh, design um, like reserve price strategies that result in maybe not completely incentive compatible mechanisms, but uh, with mechanisms with good incentive compatibility metric. Um, that's the third part. I'm almost out of time. If I take the liberty and say like we, we started like five minutes late, I'm, I'm going to give a very brief overview of the fourth part, which is uh, robustness in dynamic mechanism design. So here, the setting is very like most complicated. We are talking about uh, not static mechanisms, but dynamic mechanisms that can depend um, like your action and like your price and your allocation in this stage may depend on the action uh, and the, uh, the allocation in other stages of this repeated in interaction. So ro the dynamic mechanism design in general in economics literature is very much dependent on the predictions. We have to have predictions of the current stage and also maybe the future stages. So what we did in like this recent line of work uh, is we made um, dynamic mechanism design robust against predicting anything about the future. So we make it completely independent of the um, uh, future predictions. We only uh, uh, make assumptions on the predictions of the present, uh, of the, the current stage. And even there, we show how to deal with noisy predictions. So that's like a very high level overview and like a summary of the setting. It's um, I have to talk about the model and so on. I can't uh, because I'm out of time. I do have, uh, so like another line of work is to add like robustness against buyer heterogeneity. So there is a question of if we have different types of buyers that have different type of objective functions, how can we design an auction uh, mechanism that no matter what the buyer um, like um, utility function is, it achieves actually good property. It actually also applies to the very first part of the talk when I, when I talk about value maximizers and utility maximizers. Let me summarize this part. So on the fourth part, we do, we design what we call non-clairvoyant dynamic mechanisms where we make dynamic mechanism design independent of predicting the future. And we show that we only lose a constant factor by doing that. Uh, we also make uh, mechanism design um, like robust against noisy predictions of the present and also make it robust against different type of buyer behavior. So the research agenda in general is to move toward, uh, I said prior free, but yeah, like more robust uh, dynamic mechanism design, uh, like agenda that's less dependent on the predictions because if we make it too dependent on the predictions, it becomes a bit useless. So we have to be, make sure that it, it becomes robust. Uh, that is all. If you have questions about the third and fourth part, uh, we have time for questions, I think. I can also. Okay, thank you for the great talk. Uh, yeah. Do you have any other, uh, like a summary slide? Or oh, this is the last one? That's the last one. Okay, I see. Yeah, thank you for the great talk. Uh, uh, yeah. yeah.
So I actually have a, a high level question because in the, the second part of your talk, uh, you mentioned both online optimization and online learning. Uh, although these two are related, but the, the, there's still some uh, differentiation. So I wonder what's the learning part uh, in, your, in, in your work? Because I, maybe I missed uh, something when you uh, show your result. I, so I, I wonder what's the, the, the learning third part. part learning was about, the third part was about learning reserve prices, if you notice. Uh, like the question is how to learn reserve prices or like prices uh, where uh, like you have incentive properties. Mm, oh, so the incentive. Okay, the incentive is something. Yeah. You need to learn a policy to to give the incentive. Yeah, yeah. So like you want to learn from your data, but you know that agents who provide that data have incentive to 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 manipulate it. Uh, otherwise, yeah. But, but that's what we call incentive aware learning or robustness against gaming. Oh, okay. I see. I see. Not so like, the second part, but the third part. Okay. Okay. I see. Yeah, I didn't talk about the online learning uh, part uh, because. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so yeah, since you didn't talk about, uh, but I'm curious uh, regarding the online learning, uh, mm -hmm. what you've done is uh, online, like a continuous, uh, uh, regarding online optimization, what uh, what you've done is uh, about. Uh, it's like online uh, bandits, like simple uh, uh, bandits and like this ICML paper is uh, like a contextual setting. Uh, I see. So, we have like simple linear bandits and like we want to, we, we show that, um, yeah, like we want to get a regret uh, function, but the regret is mm -hmm. a function of how much adversarial corruption I, I have. It's a function that decreases gracefully as, a, as the number of uh, times that the, the adversary actually corrupts the, uh, the output. The, the okay, so so the corruption budget, so the, the, the corruption is measured by the number of corruption rather the than the, the magnitude of the corruption. It's like a number of corruption. Yeah, the number of times that the adversary actually corrupts. Okay. So I've seen some uh, papers, they define the corruption as the, the summation of the, the corruption, the magnitude of the uh, corruption. So which can be viewed as like a soft, uh, notion of, uh, uh, for example, number of uh, corruptions. So have you, uh, in that paper, have you uh, also considered or so thought I about say that In that line of work, there is actually uh, like a set of papers, uh, like, so for example, our, our stock paper achieves like some function uh, mm -hmm. with high probability, uh, mm -hmm. but then there is a, a result that improves uh, on that function completely, uh, but it, it holds with uh, in expectation and not with high probability. Uh, the ICML paper is also recent, but it's a stylized model. Uh, like uh, it's a contextual model where uh, basically, um, like, like it's a separable model. Like there's a click through rate and uh, the other part that, that can be corrupted. So, uh, yeah, so like there is more to be done in this space for sure. Uh, I see, I see that, that's, that, that sounds very good. I will uh, read the paper, yeah. Yeah, thank you. So any other questions from the audience? Okay, so my kids is coming. So if there's no more uh, questions, uh, let's thank uh, Fahab again for the great talk and uh, please do follow up with Fahab if you uh, have any other question or you want to discuss offline? Thank you for have. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Bye. Yeah, it's my pleasure. I will stop recording.